Four o'clock, so we're going to get started. The purpose of this press conference today is to just give a status update on three uh, areas that we want to focus on. Number one, I'll give a status update on where we're at right now currently with the investigation. Uh, we're going to talk about um, where we're at for building damage assessment and a plan moving forward to rebuild. And then we're going to talk about uh, city services and, and other uh, charitable services that have been helping out the community and the community response. Uh, and give some information to folks if, if they uh, have questions on what they can do to help out. The first thing that I want to do is I want to recognize, as you can see today, that we have interpreters for the deaf community here. For those of you who do not know, Captain Barr's parents are deaf, and they have had a lot of support and are very involved in the deaf community. What we learned through this process is that we need to make sure that deaf interpreter services are available when doing formal media conferences events, especially when someone who was impacted by an event like this is deaf. I want to personally apologize to the parents of Captain Barr and those in the deaf community for not having an interpreter there for our two formal press conferences last Wednesday morning and afternoon. Please be assured that that was not intentional on our part. We have learned from this and we will get better in the future regarding this subject and this process. So again, my personal apologies we're not having those services available during this event. All right, let's talk about where we're at in the investigation. What I can tell you right now that the investigation is still very much an ongoing process. We have made a lot of progress and we're moving forward, but we're not 100% there yet. All right, so because of that, I can't speak to any of the particulars of this investigation. What I can tell you is that hopefully within the next few days, and I say days and not weeks, within the next few days, we will be in a position where first of all, we can turn over the, the scene uh, that's fenced in right now, we can turn that over for investigative purposes, meaning there will not be a need for evidence preservation. However, that does not mean that the investigation will be concluded. That does not, the release of the scene is not tying into the completing of the investigation. There is still a lot of work that our investigators need to do. These get conducted in phases. We have the on-site uh, evidence retrieval, trying to put together exactly what happened. We're talking to a lot of people uh, that have been involved in this. Um, and when, when we get all that information, we're gonna, we're gonna sit down, we're gonna look at all of the interviews, the reports, the evidence, all right? And our investigative team is gonna make an assessment. And they're gonna make an assessment if we're going to go down the realm of this, uh, any recommendation of criminal charges or not, that's really the question that we need to answer. But understand this, for respect out of Captain Barr's family, out of respect for the people who were injured in this situation, out of respect for the business owners who lost businesses, out of respect to those uh, folks who were displaced from their homes, lost their, lost their homes, I'm not going to provide any detailed information, questions about contractors, businesses, anything like that. I know some of you have been reporting on that and that's fine, but just understand I'm not going to talk about it. I don't want us to get into the speculative game until we have all our facts at the very end, all right? And, and once we have that, we need to make the determination how this happened, why this happened, and, and quite frankly, so that we can avoid this, this ever happening again in the future. Until we are 100% there with all that, that very last fact, we just have to respect the fact that we cannot release uh, any of that information. We are not going to compromise this, this very involved and very, very important investigation. All right, let's talk about um, building, uh, I'm sorry, building damage assessment rebuilding efforts. <clears throat> Rapid assessment has been completed of the immediate structures of the buildings. I can tell you right now, Buildings that have been completely destroyed, the bar house, razor sharp screen uh, printing, American Realtors, there's an American Family Insurance building that, that was in there that was completely destroyed, Glass Nickel Pizza, the vacant water tower chop house, and some of the apartments that were above these businesses that have been completely destroyed. I will be providing a list um, and we'll send that out via electronic mail and on our website and on our Facebook page of the current status of all the business in both those blocks as far as if they're open for business, if they're closed for business, or if it's unknown. Okay, right. that's, that's, six, that's six buildings. 
destroyed. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six. That is correct. Six businesses. I'm sorry? All right, uh, Joe Pawalka building is also, okay, I don't have that on my list, but thank you for sharing that. So seven. So that would be seven. Yep. It's Barhouse, American Realtors, Razor Sharp Glass, Echo, Water Tower, Top House. American Family, is that a separate building, or are they in? I, I believe that was an office inside the professional building. Office so inside the part professional building, when the professional building was destroyed. So six buildings. Yes. Yep. It's American Realtors and American Family. They were, they were, uh, the professional building has been referred to as a multi-tenant building, yes, so that, they were both in that structure. Did everybody catch that? Seven buildings or seven businesses? Uh, six buildings, seven businesses. Thank you. You're welcome. No, it's still, again, bar homes. Razor Sharp Screen Printing, American Realtors, American Family Insurance, Glass Nickel Pizza, Water Tower Chop House, and Joel Pualka. So that would be seven in my opinion. It was a single family home and next, next to uh, the average water tower shop. So it, was a, it wasn't a business. It was All right, there we go. Six, six businesses, one resident. Okay. Our house, professional building, razor sharp, glass naked water tower. That's five structures. Correct? I believe that's correct. Thank you. That's the, I want to make sure we get the correct information here. So I appreciate you guys asking those questions and understand this. I'm going to get you as most accurate information as possible. So they're not salvageable. They're going to be home. They're, they're classified as destroyed. All right. We did have one building, which is the old city hall building, that's inside our restricted zone. Um, we did have um, our building inspection team go in and check the structural integrity of that along with an insurance company. They were the only insurance company right now that were allowed to go in to check the status of that building because that building was very close to where um, we had the majority of our evidence preservation and we wanted to make sure that that evidence wasn't going to be compromised if something were to happen to that building um, and all, obviously the safety of our investigators who were, who were working that site. So that was one building It was determined um, that the primary damage is to the roof. Uh, brick, the brick facade is stable. Uh, so that primary damage is, is isolated to the roof. There is some danger of some loose materials maybe falling. That's why if those of you who have been filming are coming up to the fence site to see our investigators wearing hard helmets, it is for that reason. That is our old city hall building. Question's been asked, can this fence be tightened up? Right now it can as long as our investigators are out there working on uh, determining if this is going to go in the realm of criminal or not. Once we've made that decision and we remove ourselves, that'll be turned over to our city building inspection, all right, and then they'll be making the determination if that fence can shrink. Um, it sounds like there's a good possibility that it, that it can be it can, can be done, um, but I don't. More information will be communicated as soon as that decision is made. If we can start securing, I'm sorry, start um, decreasing the perimeter where we're at. Uh, what I understand from uh, talking to representative of the energies, underground utilities appear to be in very good condition. I understand that utilities will need to be fixed before any road construction uh, can can be completed. As it relates to road construction and just highway diversion and street diversion, the Department of Transportation wants to do a press conference later this week. Um, that will be the logistics for that and the time and place for that will be determined through our city attorney's, I'm sorry, city administrator's office. So just understand that representatives from Department of Transportation want to speak to all of you uh, sometime mid to end of this week. Um, once we're able to start cleaning up, once the investigative component is completely finished and we can remove ourselves from that site, uh, our, our building inspection, our public works folks are going to go through the rubble piles. We understand people have personal belongings that they lost that are out there somewhere in that rubble. Um, it's going to be a long process, but we're going to be going through and, and clean, and I say we, I'm talking about representatives from the city and also private contractors that the city has worked with to go through um, and, and clean up, start cleaning up and trying to find those personal belongings. Understand and please appreciate it. It's going to be a long process, but we're also very conscious of people's belongings that they've expressed interest in, and we do whatever we can to try to find that for them. Can the community help clean up? That is a question that we've been getting a lot of. Um, I appreciate folks asking if they can clean up in that area, but right now uh, we are going to be, the city's going to be contracting with um, private contractors to do that and also our city 
public works folks. It's just too dangerous right now um, for us to ask for any volunteers to help and, and start cleaning up inside that perimeter zone when we're able to do so. Well, back to what um, uh, We Energies, uh, they've been doing some random gas leak surveys. They're not finding any gas leakage, so that's that's very good news. Uh, they have take, take places that are ready for gas, so they're continuing to work on that, and they'll be communicating with the appropriate business owners on that. The downtown systems are tight, meaning there's no gas leaks. They've been checked with handhelds, no, no gas orders. Things have, been, things have been relit over the weekend on that out, outside that, that secured zone. Business owners and residents are still able to request to go inside the perimeter zone, or, I'm sorry, inside the restricted area, um, but they still have to go through that process of meeting at the intersection of Angel and Columbus. Uh, one of our police officers will meet them along with the fire department uh, representative. We'll find out what their request is, if it's, if it's something that can be honored. We'll escort them in and get them into their, into their appropriate building to, to uh, deal with any needs that they have. But we will be assessing that. We're not guaranteeing it, but we'll assess it. Um, understand that when we, and I say we, I'm talking about our investigators, the police department and our, our agents from the Department of Criminal Investigations that have been helping us out greatly with this. Um, once we are finished with our on-site investigation process, that process of, of folks wanting to get inside that secure perimeter can still happen, but now they'll be making that request from the fire department. We will remove ourselves from the police department from that. Um, the out, outside that secure perimeter area is fine for anybody to go up to. We can go right to the fence. Um, businesses and, that are outside that fence area are fine for people to go into. Um, we're just restricting access and what we're doing inside that fence, fence perimeter. I just want to reiterate that. I think that's known, but I want to make sure everyone understands it. All right, let's talk about the community response and what our Sunshine Place is doing and, and the Red Cross. The Red Cross is, is, pulled, is pulled out. They pulled out on Friday, as you understand that they're a, more of a disaster relief for immediate needs. Um, the shelter has been closed up at the high school. Um, but if they're, they'd ask that if there's someone who hasn't received assistance, that they call 1-800-RED-CROSS. Now, they have not had any Vouchers, Hearts Closet, and our Sunshine Place are accepting groceries and brand new clothing. They ask that you all, people also uh, go to call 211 to get any updates on appropriate phone numbers, emergency uh, contacts, uh, charitable organizations, what have you, to help those folks uh, that have been displaced. The Red Cross reported that there were 66 overnight stays during this event. Over 100 people registered the first couple of nights of the event. Health services had 182 contacts, 197 disaster mental health contacts. There was over 1,000 meals and snacks served over those couple of days of the event. That would be Tuesday night into Wednesday and Thursday and into Friday. 592 meals within the shelter were served. 1,387 snacks were given out, water, canola bars, food, etc. Um, all Red Cross donations are going to the General Disaster Relief Fund. If folks want to make and donate specific donations for dedicated to this event here in Sun Prairie, they're asked to do that through the Bank of Sun Prairie. To date, now, now that that transition has made, been made to our Sunshine Place, to date Sunshine Place has met with 22 households, approximately 58 people, who have been displaced due to this tragedy all have temporary places to stay. Case managers from Sunshine Place are reaching out to them shortly with potential housing, housing leads. This is the Sunshine Place's number one priority. The Sunshine Place wants to report they don't need any more food right now. They're really good with food. They have enough resources to supply the families at the moment. As these families get housed, Sunshine Place will reach out to the community to ask for assistance on specific needs and items. We're good right now, but that could be coming later as these folks get home. If someone wants to help right now, what the Sunshine Place is asking that financial donations to the Bank of Sun Prairie is the preferred route to go. And 
they'll make sure that it gets help. Uh, those funds are helped for those folks who are going to get into permanent housing. If there is a family that's within that restricted zone and is currently displaced and has not reached the Sunshine Place, meaning there's somebody out there that we're not aware of, and the Sunshine Place is not aware of, um, we are encouraging you that you call Joanna Cervantes, and I will spell her last name. It's C E R B as in Victor, A N T E S. She is the director of the Sunshine Place, and she would like a phone call to her cell phone number, which is 608. 514-6210. Real quickly, I will touch on our local uh, emergency services and where we're at. We as a police department continue to have asked for outside law enforcement to help us with seeing security of that perimeter fence. Once we make the determination, again, that there's no need for an evidentiary purpose for that uh, security fence, we're going to ask our partners from the law enforcement community that have helped us out that they, they can go back to their communities uh, and we're going to relinquish law enforcement control of that perimeter fence. That will be handled um, by uh, the, through the city administrator's office determining if they want to use private security, if they want to use uh, city employees, but the police department and law enforcement will not be responsible for perimeter fencing. EMS was back to normal on Thursday. Our fire department, as of today at 1 p.m., their station two is up and running independently. And station one, beginning 6 a.m. tomorrow, will be running will be running solo. All the, the local fire, I'm sorry, the yes, the, the area fire departments uh, that came and, and helped us out uh, during this tragedy, uh, they will be leaving. And, and again, uh, I know a lot of appreciation for those area fire departments helping us out. It's, again, department had to deal with uh, this past week all right but things are getting back to normal and that's an important message to convey I also will finally refer uh, folks to our city of Sun Prairie website cityofsunprairie.com forward slash Sun Prairie strong um, you'll be able to find all updates including press releases press conferences like we're having here uh, appropriate phone contacts phone numbers GoFundMe pages anything that has to do with this this tragic event and that we want to get out uh, to the people who have those questions, please go to that website again, cityofsunprairie.com uh, forward slash Sun Prairie Strong. All right. With that, I will open it up for any questions. Chief, the uh, Wee Energy says that on average, 100 gas mains are struck yearly. Uh, what can you tell uh, the public to assure them that going forward, if there was a additional construction work to hit a gas main, that the outcome wouldn't be as disastrous. What I said before, that's what we want to get to. So that's why it's, it's imperative to me that I do not release any information uh, as it relates to this investigation, because this investigation is twofold. It's number one, it's finding out exactly what happened here. Why did this happen? How did this happen? And was there any criminal negligence? We don't have the answer to that question yet. We're getting very close. Like I said, we're making a lot of progress. And I can tell you, I'm, I'm confident telling you, we're very, getting very close to make that decision. But that is a question we need to answer. And uh, trust me when I say, we're not, gonna, we're not gonna get into that now until we get all those facts. And once we get all those facts, that information is gonna be reported and communicated. Because yes, a, a goal for us too is, we never wanna see something like this happen again. Not only in our community, but, but any other community out in this, in this nation, in this state, this nation that, that can learn from us. Just a follow-up, so for now, the gas leak surveys, those are the methods right now that you're using to try to ensure safety? So, yeah, what, from what I understand talking to Representative Lee Energy today, that, that they're out there and they, all the gas has been shut off, there's no signs of leakage, um, they're, they're out there continually monitoring that to make sure that, that things are safe. But people are allowed, uh, the other thing is, is when business owners want to go back into that restricted zone, um, We've been assured by We Energies that that gas has been completely shut off and it's good. There'll still be a representative if they're on site to go in with the fire department, with the police officer to make sure things are good. But what I was told is that everything is shut off and there's no no gas leaks at this time. Kevin, if you have to make a judgment as to when Main Street might be reopened, you're saying days, you say it might be days before once the investigation's done on site, but then how long before traffic is flowing on Main that's going to be a while. I can just tell you that. That's going to be a while. That's going to be weeks uh, at the very least. Really? I would like to think that when the Department of Transportation 
that was their press conference this week that they'll be in a little better position to answer that. But understand that um, we first of all have to make sure that all the utilities and, and everything is, is, is good to go. We have to, there's going to be buildings that are going to be cleaned up, raised. Um, there has to be a to make determination exactly what's going to be cleaned out of there. And then we're going to talk about uh, road travel and road reconstruction. Because um, the road's going to have to be rebuilt. Yeah. It's not safe to drive on right now. Correct. Correct. Yeah, but I have a question on the buildings that are in within the restricted area. Other than the old city hall, is the city going to have any inspectors go in structural engineers to inspect the buildings? Or is all that going to wait until after your investigation? Yes, that, yes. That is going to happen, but it's going to happen after our investigation. And like I said, I will reiterate this again. We're days, not weeks, from making that determination. And I, I will tell you, we're, we're very, very close when we can make a determination that we need to be on site. But I want to reiterate again, just because we're not on site and it, there's no need for criminal need anymore uh, for evidence preservation, that doesn't mean our investigation is done. We still have a lot of work to do now to get back and go through everything. But as far as the site goes, we are very close to being done and we need to be on the site. And once that happens, then yes, there will be a plan through our city engineering department and our building inspection department to do exactly what you just asked. And I don't know if you're capable of answering the question about the fire department, but there is a question in your prison about the volunteer. I don't. I just don't have those numbers. Can I ask you for a clarification? So this, you have not ruled out the possibility that you could bond from that is correct. So um, what we're doing right now is, like I mentioned before, our investigative team is working very hard all right, to, to figure out how this happened, why this happened. And the question we have to answer is, was there any criminal negligence? And that's what we're looking to determine. Um, but we haven't, we haven't got that answer yet. Um, that, that's what we're looking at. And we hope to have an idea of that answer sooner than later, but we're not there yet. If the uh, subcontractor didn't locate the pipes, would that be caused for criminal negligence? I'm not going to talk about what we're looking at. As for the people who work in some of those buildings that are fenced off, is there any assistance for them to rely on those salaries for your lenders? Uh, again, I, I don't have the answer to that. I will tell you this. Once we have made a determination of, of the investigative component, we as a police department are going to remove ourselves from that. That type of information will come out um, on the city website, uh, like I mentioned. We'll, and we're taking an idea of questions that you have that maybe I don't have the answer to, but that's what that city that web page will be for to get that information out. And one thing the city has been doing a really good job of is having um, meetings with our business community that are affected there. I'm assuming we're going to have uh, another meeting. I'm going to look at, at Neil here to confirm that because I don't want to get false information. We'd like to see another one this week. Yes. All right, so there you go. And so that would be an appropriate forum for those folks to have those questions answered. Okay, just, just to be clear, so once you're off-site, investigative wise, yes. you're going to remove, you're going to go through the rubble, look for personal stuff, and then you're going to clear the building. Are you, are you going to tear the buildings down and then fix the road before you open everything back up? Or? Yep, those are decision points that need to be made in conjunction with city engineering, our building inspection, and department transportation. That's the plan moving forward, though. They haven't come to what that exact strategy is. That's why we're talking about this. It, it, that's why we're talking about this. Do you intend is the district attorney involved in the consultations as you uh, get closer to making your determinations as to whether criminal negligence is involved. Yes. Do you anticipate another update this week? Yeah, I will tell you this. Uh, I, I know you folks have been very, very patient, and I, and I appreciate that. Understand that I'm not a full-time public information officer. I also have responsibilities as a lieutenant with this police department. Um, but I'm going to try to get you as much information as we, as we can. I will. My pledge to all of you and to this community is that once we've determined what we're going to do with our investigation, I will be announcing that as soon as I possibly can. Hey, yeah, Matt, have you heard of any complaints of fraudulent activities or um, like bogus charities or anything of that nature? No, that's, that's a good question you ask because uh, something that we've been learning by uh, uh, talking to representatives with the Red Cross and with emergency management is, you know, uh, 
hypothetically, those are things that have, uh, um, anecdotally, those are things that have happened in the past with some other disasters, uh, disaster situations. Fortunately, uh, right now, we don't have anything like that. And I hope that that's continued. Um, question about the evacuation Yeah, that was confirmed by um, by the uh, fire chief. Yeah, he, approximately 65 people. Um, I also heard it was up over 100. Uh, and I know at least, at least, and I'm very comfortable giving you that answer, at least 65 people were evacuated by our fire What does that mean about this? I think that message speaks for itself right there. I'll tell you what. With, what those firefighters did in those 30 minutes before that building exploded was nothing short of a phenomenal. They did their job, and that, they'll be the first to tell you, don't call us heroes, you know, don't say that, we did our job. But thank God they did their job, because when I arrived on scene when this happened and I took a look at that, I'll tell you right now, the first thing that was going through my mind is, my God, we're going to find a bunch of a bunch of bodies in there. Knowing how bustling the city of St. Curry is at that time on a Tuesday night at, at 6.30, 7 o'clock at night, and especially you know, in, in those bars and restaurants. Um, and, and I'll tell you what, thank God for our fire department because the efforts they did in that half hour to get everybody out of there. And, you know, they were very firm and forceful and good for them because it, it saved them a uh, huge loss of life. Anything else? All right, I appreciate it, folks. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll continue to communicate as, as more information becomes available. All right, thank you.